welcome back to the Daughter Arise channel. Hope that you're all well today. I'm doing good. I've just been busy preparing for the gift poetry event. As I mentioned in the last video, we are going to be doing Daughter Arise. is going to be doing a poetry evening event on Saturday the 23rd of September. And basically it's an evening of encouraging other survivors and empowering them to find their voice in the aftermath of abuse. Now I will be sharing my poetry um, along with a couple of other ladies who bravely have um, agreed to come and share some of their poems as well. And also as well we will be doing affirmations um, encouraging other people and also we will have an open mic session so if you're somebody who um, is not sure if you want to um, get involved in this but you buy a ticket you come along and decide actually I would like to share something you will be able to do so so as I said t um, it's going to be on Saturday the 23rd of September it's going to be 6 to 10 p.m. at bar 48 the flyer is getting done as we speak, so hopefully by the next video I will have that. Sorry there's been a bit of delay with different things going on and with the six weeks holidays over here in England, um, the kids are out on a uh, summer break, which has meant that also that I am also, you know, doing things with my daughter as well. So some things have been a little bit delayed, so please bear with me. But as soon as I have those details, I will let you know and we'll also um, let you know where you can get tickets. Now, there's only gonna be 35 tickets available for the event. It's gonna be a very small event and it's gonna be a one-time only exclusive. Um, so when the um, details are made known, I would suggest that you get your tickets early. If you fancy coming along for a bit of a different evening, um, it's going to be, as I said, at Bar 48. It's an Eritrean uh, tapas type restaurant. And also as well, we will be having the in-house jazz band do some music in between the different sessions as well. So it's a bit of a different night out, but it promises to be uplifting, empowering and inspiring. So I will let you know more details soon. So today I wanted to do my last in uh, my three-part series, a tale of three male celebrities who have been through sexual abuse. Now, if you haven't had a chance, please check out my other videos um, on Chester Bennington and Mike Tyson. And um, I shared a bit about their background in those videos. But today I'm going to be talking about Robert Kelly, better known to you if you do know him as R. Kelly the 90s um, R&B superstar who had a hit uh, a, a string of a set successful string of hits um, during that time and even up to the early 2000s as well he does still tour and still has a huge following and today I want to talk about his story and um, share with you some of my th my thoughts and commentary on um, what he um, has said about his experience. So Robert Kelly, he grew up in he grew up in um, Chicago, Southside Chicago. Um, apparently, this is like one of the kind of poorer side of towns, a bit like a ghetto, like a ghetto type environment um, where there was lots of um, poverty um, in a poor neighborhood. He grew up with his mother. He didn't have his father around. But he describes his relationship with his mother as um, a very close relationship. And um, he doesn't really do a lot of interviews as such. And what's interesting is that when he does interviews, he's quite um, imposes a lot of kind of restrictions on what he will and won't talk about. But um, back a few years ago, he did actually do a, quite an open interview with GQ magazine and allowed the reporter to kind of talk to him a bit more about the man behind the music. And it was during this interview that um, R. Kelly said that he was sexually abused as a child and um, the abuse was um, at the hands of a um, female relative and um, how it had an effect on him. So he was abused from the age of seven to eight he said seven or eight to the age of 14 or 15. The abuse only stopped because, uh, you know, he had a, he got a girlfriend and um, kind of, I think that kind of pulled him away a bit and 
I think the, the, the female predator, she got a bit tired of it as well. But he was talking about the experience and how it happened to him and how it affected him and, you know, how he tried to deal with it. So he says that, you know, when he was about seven or eight, he was lying down on the sofa, um, sleeping, watching TV, when this female relative came in and performed a sex act on him and and fondled him as well and he, he described the moment as he kind of came to from his sleep and thought it was a dream um because obviously you, you know you couldn't believe that was happening to him but actually as soon as the woman was finished he tried to get up he said he tried to get up and when he tried to get up the woman wouldn't let him as you can imagine this is a seven eight year old boy and this is a big um woman who's doing this to him she wouldn't let him up until she had finished um, doing what she had to do when she did finish she said that she basically said to him you better not tell anybody or you're going to get your ass whooped so right there in the first instance we see where the predator the abuser um threatens the um, victim with uh with violence or with something that you know will scare them into keeping quiet so that is what she did he then went on to say that the, the abuse carried on, as I said, from the age of 7 or 8 to the age of 14, 15. And it was over, it was, it was, actually, quite, it was actually quite consistent in what, when it was happening. So he would say it would be every other week, every day. So it would be one week on, one week off. And when that week was on, she would do it every single day. He said that how it made him feel ashamed. Um, he wasn't sure how to take it but after a while he was saying that he enjoyed it um, and I think what he was talking about when he was mentioning that was about the arousal the arousal side of it not actually enjoying the act of what this woman was um, doing to him he then describes that you know um, you know he didn't have that type of relationship with his mother even though they were close to him to be able to kind of talk to her about those things and so he dealt with it by, by internalizing it himself and he said that and um, when the interviewer asked him um so what do you think now about what that person has had done to you he said that um basically he forgave her but he um he doesn't blame her because he thinks that maybe she had been abused therefore was abusing him and it was like a generational thing. I can speak a little bit on this as um, a black woman growing up in a uh, black community, black culture, of how certain things are generationally passed down. And this is not something new, you know, the Bible talks about things being passed down from the forefathers and goes through generations. So we know that things can be passed down through the generations. Now in the black community, and I'm not talking here about the white community, as I said, I'm talking about as a black woman who's coming from uh, parents of Caribbean descent, there is a real issue with um, sexual abuse within the community. And it's not just this community, it's the African community, because I've spoken to people in the African community as well, because, you know, sexual abuse doesn't have no, that doesn't show favour to your background of any kind. And yes, I do know that it does go on in the white community. It goes on probably in a different way because with the hierarchy in the upper classes they um, inbreed and incest is just become a normal way of life they they interbreed and do all these types of things so we know that that generation is passed how they pass it down um, in, in with their families but in the Caribbean African cultures this is something that continues to happen over and over and over again and even the act of kind of enabling and and keeping quiet is something that is a huge problem now I can speak from my experience for instance you know I am a survivor of childhood sexual abuse um, and my father in his childhood was physically abused um, and this is his own words, you know, during one of these little times where he used to try and talk to me when I was a child about his issues, which I really wasn't interested in. But one time he told me that he was burnt with a pot and things like that, and he suffered physical abuse as a child. Now, what happened with my father is, is that he went then went on to um, have a relationship with my gran, which was my mother's mother. And then, you know, he went on to have a relationship with my with my mother at a very young age. 
and also as well when I was born as the firstborn of that relationship he went on when I got to nine to start sexually abusing me so this is an example of generational sexual abuse and other women who I know from my work at Daughter Rise, friends that I have, colleagues that I have, sexual abuse has also run generationally down in their families as well. And it's something that is rarely not even really talked about and it's just kind of sometimes accepted as the norm within the, within these families that have it going on. You have the ones that are doing it and then you have the enablers, the ones that keep quiet and this mentality just seems to go round and round in circles. Now, sexual abuse is not something that is, that is new generationally. This has been going back to, the, to, um, to slavery, where the slave masters um, would use rape and, and sexual abuse of the women, of the female slaves, to keep them in line, to, do, to, to control them. And also as well, male slaves being sodomized and buggered by, by the, the, the slave masters as a way of emasculating them and and welding power and dominance over them so we know that generational sexual abuse is passed down through the generations and what r kelly says here is that it's like an acceptance of that but the thing is it is still wrong also as well sexual abuse at its very core the the, the heat the, the petrol that fuels the vehicle of sexual abuse is lust Lust is what is the is the, the controlling and um, dominating factor of sexual abuse. Sexual abuse is just the vehicle that is used to target the child or the victim, but it's the lust that is behind it. And in R. Kelly's case, I mean, he talks about the fact when the interviewer said to him, "You know, um, how have you dealt with what has happened to you?" Because obviously, just from reading the interview, it was kind of it was kind of evident that the, the interviewer was kind of taken aback by all that R. Kelly had shared and he kind of whiffed it off like oh you know it doesn't bother me anymore I've put that so far to the back of my mind I don't even think about it but I think and this is just my opinion with R. Kelly that that how his experience of being sexually um, molested and controlled at a young age has affected him is that he's a very hypersexualized um, a man he's he, everything he does is very sexual the way he talks the way he behaves everything his whole persona his superstar persona is all based upon sex and it's sad really because you know here is somebody who I believe has um, sexual addiction now there isn't a lot of uh, um, documented lots of research that has very clear numbers of the amounts that we're talking about but one uh, research piece of research that I did come across said that 71% of um, um, people who had sexual, sexual addiction were physically abused in childhood while 81 to 84% um, um, sexual abuse who were sexually abused in childhood also had sexual addiction problems and that is stemmed from the part of the brain where that deals with arousal so if you are force riped meaning introduced to behaviors and things before the period of time in your life you're supposed to be introduced to it it can cause real problems so that's part of the brain um, that deals with arousal in R Kelly's case as a young child he was sexually abused um, consistently um, continuously over a long period of time aroused before his time his brain, while was being while being aroused, doesn't understand what that arousal is for, which is completely damaging to a child if that happens. And it's something that a lot of survivors struggle with as well because they think that um, because my body reacted in the normal way that a body is supposed to act to arousal, that means that I'm complicit in the crime that has been committed against me, and nothing is um, further from the truth. So in R. Kelly's case, with what he's with with all that is going on with him as well, I mean, he has you know consistently stayed in the news um, back from the early nineties of cases where he has been taken to court for having child pornography. Um, you know, there was cases even before that court documents that are available on the internet which talked about him um, being caught outside secondary schools, um, trying to solicit young girls. 
um, he has a an uh, has a, an issue, a fetish for underage girls, and I believe it is stemmed from that spirit of lust, um, that sexual addiction that is driving him, um, that drives the things that he does as well, and it's really sad. I think he thinks maybe that by not talking about it, putting it to the back of his mind, that he's actually dealt with it, but he hasn't dealt with it. And one of the things that happens with sexual abuse is that if you don't deal with it, it crops up somewhere subconsciously um, in another area of your life, whether that be in your sexual preferences, um, your parenting um, issues, in your relationships, in addictions. As I said in my other videos, Mike Tyson, his um, his experience affected him with the point to the point where he was so angry, had a lot of rage. Chester Bennington had, um, you know, drug and alcohol addiction problems, and you know, with, and with R. Kelly, he has sexual addiction problems, and it's really, um, it's really sad to see. But one of the things that is also helping him to not be able to address his problems is having people around him that are enablers. People who are not telling him the truth, people who are, um, and it's almost in a way, it kind of reminds me a little bit of with Jimmy Savile. The fact of the matter is, you know, Jimmy, Jimmy Savile was allowed to wait, uh, get away with the things he got away with because of his c celebrity status. You know, people noticed things were wrong, people noticed news behaviour was wrong, knew, witnessed things with him and young girls, but because of his star power and the intimidation of that, they kept their mouth closed, they didn't say nothing to him, they didn't alert the correct authorities. Um, the fact that R. Kelly has been paid off a lot of uh, young girls, he's, you know, girls have had abortions, um, girls where he's had sexual relationships with them, even Aaliyah, as, you know, as I said, he married at 15 and that marriage had to be annulled and no one was ever allowed to talk about it from either side of the camp, shows that he has a problem with this and just because he hasn't been found guilty of it, you know, he has a problem with this, he's been able to kind of get himself out of these situations, but sooner or later it is really going to catch up with him and, you know, um, sexual addiction, there are places out there that can help with that, you know, and he has the money to be able to access the help and that's what he needs to do. It's unfortunate that he said that he also said in the interview that he will never mention that woman, he will never bring up her name or anything like that because he doesn't see the need to. But this is again another issue that we have within our community and in general across the whole epidemic to do with sexual abuse. If you think that by not naming that person is doing you or doing them any favours, please believe it's not. Because all these people do is go on to do it to somebody else. If you might not even be the first victim, um, R. Kelly doesn't know if he was the first victim or not. He's only seen as far as his nose can go in the fact that she was in front of him. He's trying to make excuses for her. And what is sad is that when he tried to confront her about her behaviour years later, she had the cheek to turn and said to him, oh, you must have been just dreaming. And this is the callousness of a lot of um, people who commit sexual abuse. This is how they behave. They minimalise the damage that they have done to their victim and survivor, which compounds the pain of that survivor even further. You know, um, her, her callousness, though, is not unnoticed by God. So people who do this, who think they're getting away with it now, they have to put them, get themselves in check and put themselves right because, you know, you have to take responsibility for your behaviour. So even though I don't agree with the things that R. Kelly has done. There's, you know, I think he's a very sick man. I don't support his music. I don't um, support him in that way at all. But he is somebody that has been through sexual abuse who's never dealt with his issues. Or maybe it's too frightening to deal with his issues. I can't imagine how hard that must have been to confront somebody. Actually, I do know, because when I confronted my dad, actually, he told me I was a liar and whatever. But that doesn't negate from the fact that that is still very painful to hear that you have done something to somebody, you've you, you've turned their life upside down, but then you behave like um, it's no big deal. So I can only imagine how hurtful and humiliating that must have been for him. Um, and yes, you know, there are cases where people who've been molested, sexually abused as children do go on to commit those crimes, but that is not always the case, you know. Um, 
it's not always the case. I haven't done that. There's many, many others out there that haven't done that. And people who have done that, and then you will say, because I knew somebody who said that, well, it, ha it happened to me as a child, and was trying to use that then as an excuse for the pain that he inflicted on the children that, um, that he abused. It, it's, it's unacceptable. You need to get help for those kind of issues. And, you know, this is why we have to be upfront and talk about sexual abuse. As I said, sexual addiction is a big thing for some people. Um, I've known males who have been sexually abused and how they've tried to deal with their circumstances and deal with their experience, even though it's been hurtful to them, is to try and put it like they were in control. So they'll say, oh, well, I enjoyed it anyway, or, you know, um, you know, it made me into a man or whatever. But actually, that is not the way they really, really feel. Actually, they feel confused and conflicted by what's happened to them. So, um, you know, I really hope that R. Kelly can get the help that he needs to deal with what I believe is his sex addiction. And, you know, um, going forward that, you know, um, the damage that has been done, you know, can, can be kind of, that he can start to kind of heal from that. And, you know, and also the pain and stuff, he needs to take responsibility for his own actions, what he's done to others as well. So they can in turn also start to, it's, it's really unfair to be blamed as a child um, for, for abuse that has been committed against you. Sexual abuse and sexual addiction um, in the aftermath of that is, is, is terrible. Anybody that has an addiction will tell you, you know, it's very, very overwhelming and overpowering. So that is all I really want to say about um, um, R, R. Kelly in terms of that. Um, this video was really just to deal with the fact looking at his sexual abuse and you know he is he was terribly abused as a child and um, and left unchecked. It's slowly eating him, eating, I believe eating him away and you know I hope that you know this video you found it uh, helpful um, there are organisations out there that can that can help you if you are um, a male survivor of sexual abuse. You can contact Daughter Rise. I be you know I can um, I'd be more than happy to have a conversation with you. Um, you can contact us via the website, which is www.daughterarise.org.uk. If you are somebody who needs encouragement for everyday issues, everyday uh, stuff to do with issues surrounding sexual abuse please check out my Pope in the Future blog so you click on the my blog tab at the top of the page and if you haven't seen my other two videos in the series on um, a tale of three male celebrities male sexual abuse please uh, look at one of the videos in the left hand corner you'll see the logo in the other corner you'll see uh, one of the videos please feel free to check it out and Please support and like this video and share it. Anybody that you know that's been through um, sexual abuse, who you think might benefit from the videos on this channel, please uh, share it with them and support this channel by liking the videos. Okay, until next time, hope you have a good weekend. Take care.